Listen to it. What's going on guys? Welcome back. My name is Brandon and today we've got a fun welding episode where we're going to be welding some cast iron but it's going to be a weird one so stick around. So this commenter said lately I've been TIG welding a lot of cast iron but I use a different procedure. Try using a stainless steel rod with a copper wire rolled in it. Well that's not the only time I've received this type of response. I've gotten this probably five or six other times. So if five or six other people are saying that this works and they're encouraging me to try it, that means obviously they've had some success with it. So obviously these people know something more that maybe we don't. So we're going to try it. I'm going to find out. I'm going to do some research and we're going to see if this thing works. So this is what we got guys. Let me get you up to speed. We've got a piece of cast iron. And what we did was, is we hung some weight off this handle and figured out how much actual uh, weight it took to snap this handle off. Then we've repaired it using some different methods and we've recorded the results to see how they compare from one process to the other. Well, the reason I'm doing this is because there's a lot of uh, mystery, it seems like, on the internet when it comes to repairing cast iron. And as long as you follow a few basic principles, Repairing cast iron isn't all that difficult. I have a cast iron repair playlist and I'll put a link up above that you guys can check out and I'll also put it down in the video description. It covers tons, probably everything you'd ever want to know on repairing cast iron. This cast iron pan took 218 pounds to snap this handle off. Then we prepped the area and we welded it with muggy weld. It took 157 pounds to snap it off or a 28% reduction in strength. Then we cleaned it up again. We welded it with flux core, 30 thousandths wire. It took 70.8 pounds to snap it off, so it decreased the strength by 32%. And for the last one, 30 thousandths wire, it broke at 176.8 pounds, which resulted in a 19.2% decrease from its original strength. And if you guys go check out that playlist, you'll find out all the details of everything we did to make these repairs. And the reason I do these kind of unorthodox repairs or kind of like uh, backyard scientific experiments is because not everyone has the, you know, optimized tools for repairing cast iron. Not everybody has an oxyacetylene setup or a stick welder with nickel rods. There's a ton of ways to fix this and oxyacetylene is the preferred method. It's kind of like the go-to that everyone does. We all know that that is going to work. It's these other processes that, you know, you at home may not have. Maybe you guys don't have an oxyacetylene setup and you want to know how does it compare if you're going to fix it with MIG versus if you stick weld it together. Well, you're going to find those answers in that cast iron welding play series. There's a ton of information in there. So one of the first things we got to do is we got to get this weld ground back down and we got to get this part to pretty much looking like it was uh, before it was welded. Now I know each time we repair this we're kind of changing the grain structure just a little bit. We're probably making it a little more brittle because we're adding uh, heat in the heat affected zone and the reason that cast iron is so brittle and difficult to weld is that it has a high carbon content. So that's what makes this stuff brittle. That's what makes it hard to weld. We're gonna do it today with a preheat and we're gonna be talking a lot about this as we go of why we're doing what we're doing. And hopefully I can give you guys uh, some real good information that if you have a piece of broken cast iron that you'll feel confident after watching this video that you can make the repair yourself and it'll be a worthy repair. So let's get going, let's get this uh, cleaned up a little bit, get it back uh, to you know bright shiny metal. Now I want to make something really clear, I would never advocate anyone repairing a cast iron pan. In fact, I would actually strongly encourage you not to do it because God forbid if you ever were to repair this cast iron and you were using it and you had hot grease on the stove and your weld happened to break or it failed and there was a hairline crack that you were not aware of, and someone got hurt or your house burned down, it's just not worth it, guys. The only reason I'm using a cast iron pan for this test series is because it's a material that we can all agree that it, that it is cast iron. It's called cast iron pan 
Uh, that way it takes out all that equation of people saying, well, no, that's made of steel or something or this, that, and the other. So it's a readily known material that it is made of cast iron so that that just removes that element of debate out of there. I think we can all agree that a cast iron pan is made of cast iron. Anytime you're grinding, you want to make sure that you have proper protection. For one, you want to make sure you've got some safety glasses on because eye injuries are no fun. I've got a ton of them in my life through welding and fabrication and it's just, it's horrible. And you want to make sure you've got a good respirator, that you're not breathing in these uh, the dust from not only the grinding of the metal, but actually from the abrasive wheel itself, the, the actual rock material. You don't want to be breathing that in. Now you have a couple different options when you use this. Now I use a 3M style half face mask for welding, and the reason I like this style is because it fits underneath my hood. And these uh, just come off, these little ones here, they're super cheap. Back before the whole pandemic thing, this whole setup was like 20 bucks. I'm not sure how much they are now, but I will have links to them. The cartridges, uh, there's a huge misconception that these types of cartridges are just like a nuisance cartridge for like dust. They're not. These 2000 series, you know, the 2097, 2091, those are probably the most popular for welding. Don't quote me, but I believe that the 2091, and the difference between the 2097 is that this actually has a carbon uh, element in it. So like a charcoal element. So the 2097s will help filter out I think a little bit more organic uh, matter, but these are for welding, grinding, and metal fabrication. If you look, 2091, it's good for metal fumes produced from welding, brazing, cutting, and other operations involving heating of metals, uh, radioactive particulate materials such as uranium and plutonium asbestos. 2096, uh, I don't see those too much. Uh, but those are also for welding and 2097. Those are also for welding, grinding, those types of operations. So yeah, 2091, 2097, those are the most common. They're flat, low profile, and they fit under your welding hood. So this is a great, inexpensive option to just use around the shop when you're grinding, cutting, welding. Uh, doing stuff that you don't want to breathe in your lungs. Now just one more thing. I don't want to go too far off base and go down this rabbit hole. Start talking about OSHA levels and all that other stuff. But, you know, one would know just from being in the trades forever that once you have a beard or any facial hair, that negates all pretty much the mask's purpose to begin with because then you have air leaks. So you know, on a construction job, you get fit tested for these to make sure that, you know, you can breathe with them on, that it provides an airtight seal, that the mask is sealed to your face, that you have it properly adjusted. We're, you know, the guys that are watching this channel, they just want to have some good protection. So if you have a beard, guys, just know that your, your mask is not going to seal to your face the way it should or the way it would if you didn't have facial hair. But something is better than nothing. So if you have a beard and you put that on, your body will thank you for it. Your lungs are going to thank you for it because you're going to see that all the stuff on the outside of those cartridges, you're going to see that uh, stuff that did not go into your lungs. So a little bit of protection is better than no protection the way I look at it. So with that said, let's get back to it. One of the first things you got to do before you weld any cast iron is that you got to determine that it is cast iron that can be welded, preferably like a gray cast iron. And if you want to know how to determine if it's cast iron or not, and if you can weld it or not, I have a video, five ways to determine whether or not it's cast iron, and I'll have a link to that video up above. That'll tell you guys what you need to look for to determine if it's cast iron that can be welded. So now you can see I got the joint prepped. I put a slight bevel on the metal just a little bit just so I have a place for the weld metal to go and I've done the same thing on the pan I've cleaned it up I've made sure that it's free of any contaminants and that's what you guys are going to want to make sure that you do before any welding process not just cast iron is make sure that your metal is down to bright and shiny there's no contaminants no oil and that it's clean 
So to get the best success or the chance of your weld not cracking, because that's what happens when you weld cast iron, is it cools down. You can start hearing it like crank. It just like ting, ting, ting. And then all of a sudden there's a crack that develops. Well, you don't want that. So the key to welding cast iron is to heat it up around four or 500 degrees. You can do that by either heating it in your stove or heating it on a gas grill, get it nice and hot, uh, maintain that temperature. And then as you're welding it, you're just gonna do little short welds and then peen the weld. Peening means hitting it with a hammer and it, it basically normalizes the metal. It, it elongates it, it expands it. And then to cool it, uh, preferably you want to put it back in the oven and slowly turn down the temperature over the course of time and if that's not an option you can always bury this in like dry sand that'll help insulate it and keep it from uh, cracking as it's cooling or you can even wrap it in a welding blanket but the key is is to heat it up make the repair and allow it to cool down slowly sometimes this stuff will be hot 20 hours later after the repair if you've buried it in sand you want it to cool down nice and slow but what i like to do now is because now the joints all prepped it would be ready to go into like a preheat is i like to just put a quick tack on the part using whatever process you can just to hold that handle on there or to hold your piece together because the last thing you want to do is pull this out of a hot oven and then hold on to this part that's 500 degrees with a gloved hand as you try to get everything perfectly lined up uh, right now the part is cool and it's a good candidate for a nice tack so that you can get this held together then you can throw it into your heat source and then when you pull it out your, your part is still all together and then you can start welding you don't have to be fiddling with it trying to get everything to line up perfectly for this i like to just use mig with solid wire and just put a quick tack on it to hold it in place and that works great so you're just going to tack this up real quick uh, for this like i said i'm using uh, solid wire MIG, 30 thousandths diameter, I'm using C25 gas, uh, but if you didn't have that, you could use flux core, that works. Uh, you could use, if you got a stick welder, you could use uh, 7018 rod, that'll work. Um, yeah, so you just stick it together with what process you have, chances are it's going to hold. So this is where it's real important for fit up. Make sure your fit up is good right now because this is where your part's going to end up. So if your fit up is good, the part will be the strongest. If it broke off, it should feel like it's keying in, you know what I mean? Like a little keyway. That feels pretty good right there. Yep, that's good. Throw another one. There. And that's all it takes, guys, right there to hold it. Listen to it. See, that is that creaking and cracking sound. And what causes that is, is that the cast iron is super strong, but it's brittle because of that high carbon content. I heated it up thousands of degrees real quick by putting that weld on there and now it's cooling real quick. So it's that rapid expansion and contraction that we're looking to not have. By heating this up and putting this in the oven, what this does is, is instead of it going from like 70 degree room temp to a thousand degrees welding temp, it might be going from 500 degrees after we heat it then to a thousand. So it's just a shorter window of, of expansion you know I'm just using those numbers as, as a example but uh, rather than go from 70 to a thousand it's might be going from 500 to a thousand it's less of a swing it's less stress on the part so yeah now at this point we can throw this in the oven I'm gonna set it for 450 475 and I'm gonna throw it in for about an hour all right guys this is where it's gonna start getting interesting uh, I've got a piece of uh, Romex house wire which we're gonna remove the copper out of and I've got a piece of 330 seconds, 308L stainless steel TIG wire. So let's uh, try this. I'm pretty excited about it. Look at that. Here's our copper TIG wire.
interesting because copper's got a pretty high melting strength so this ought to be pretty interesting I just went back and just verified so he says yeah stainless steel rod with a copper wire rolled in it so now we'll roll that uh, copper wire into it now he didn't specifically say how to do it but we will uh, just clamp it in the vise and then just twist it up with a pair of pliers <clears throat> Something like that. Just to keep it simple, I will cut it off the same length. So, I guess that's rolled up into it, guys, I guess. There it is. Now, we'll try to get this into position. This block's like 17 pounds, so it's just a piece of flat bar. Okay, that way it stands it up, and now I can just work right here. Now we just got to set up our welder, and for doing this process, I'm going to be doing TIG and I'm going to be using my Yes Welder TIG 250. Now this is a 250 amp TIG welder that will do AC and DC, meaning that with AC you can weld aluminum with it. Now this machine is right around I think $749 roughly and I looked at a lot of different machines when I was deciding to do this and one of the machines that I looked at was Prime Weld, that was one of them in Everlast. But for the money, for me, this was just the better value because it's a 250 amp machine. Some of the other machines that I was looking at were 200 amps. So I really wanted a 250 amp machine because aluminum takes a lot of amperage. And this welder allows me to do it all. Aluminum, steel, stainless steel, everything. Chrome molly, you name it, I can do it with this machine. And it's got plenty of amperage to be able to do it. It's got a foot pedal. So we're going to be setting it up right now. And because I'm going to be using stainless steel and copper, those are both materials that you'd use straight argon with. So that's exactly what we're going to be using to do this. So again, like I said, this is an experiment. I've had several people say that this works really good. I've never tried it. I really don't even know what to set my flow rates to or my machine up. So we're just going to kind of wing it and I'm going to go over with you guys how I came up with those numbers. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to fire up the machine. Do that just by snapping on the switch on the back. Then that will bring on the front face plate. And now we just got to change the mode that we're on. So that right now signifies AC TIG. Then that signifies AC pulse. There's DC TIG. That'd be DC pulse. And then the last one would be stick welder. So this also does stick welding as well, which is a... Pretty awesome feature. So there, yeah, we're all set up. We're on DC, TIG. And yeah, now we'll set the parameters. We are at 130 amps. So now it's it's gonna have a little indicator on here because we don't have any gas going to it. So, so we're gonna go to 3.2. That'll be good there. Now we're set up. Let's go turn on our gas. So we're gonna open up the bottle real slow. There we go. And we're gonna open it all the way because that's how these types of uh, non-flammable gases seal going all the way open and then we'll have to set our CFH I just put a new bottle on it as you can see there so we're at about 2,000 psi roughly I'm gonna adjust my post flow down to like two seconds something like that so you can see I'm zoomed in on my flow meter right now and I'm gonna hit the foot pedal And it looks like I'm about 17 CFH. Now I mentioned in last week's video how you can read these. Now you see this right here? This is actually telling you that you read this from the middle of the ball. All gauges are different. Some you read from the top of the ball, some from the middle of the ball. This one obviously you read it from the middle. So I'm going to go just a little bit more, right around probably like 20 CFH, and we'll give that a try. That's the only thing I don't particularly like about this machine. You don't have like a toggle switch where you can just toggle the solenoid. 
So I'm going to go a little bit more. There we are, right there. Look at that. Might be a little over 20. But that's good. One of the things to really consider when you're welding cast iron is to not put a ton of welding heat input into it. Right now, I've just pulled it out of the oven. Uh, the, it was in there for almost an hour at 475. And now what we got to do is we got to start welding it up. And we're going to do it in short beads. And then we're just going to peen it a little bit as we go. And that's going to help elongate the metal. Although stainless steel isn't overly known uh, to be good at elongating, this copper is soft and it will. So I'm thinking that maybe that that is the rationale behind using the stainless and copper because stainless is a known filler for uh, repairing cast iron. It's one of the things that you can do, uh, but copper is soft. So I'm thinking that between the copper and the stainless, I'm not a metallurgist, I don't really know. But I think that the probably the copper is what kind of gives it, it its elongation. So we'll see. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to weld up this little corner right here. And then we can grind our tack out and then we can weld along this. Preferably we don't want to leave these steel tacks in there. And for my hood guys, I'm using my Yes Welder. It's a clear view, true view, 180 degree panoramic helmet, and I absolutely love it. I've never looked through a hood that looks like this. The colors are real. That's why it's called uh, True Color. So it's pretty awesome. And if you want to know about any of the equipment that me, you see me using, I'll have links down in the description. And I also have discount promo codes that you guys can use as well. I try to show you guys equipment that works good, that's budget uh, friendly and budget-minded because I know that a lot of you guys just are like everyone else. We're all on a budget. We've got expenses and everything else and uh, I don't want to see you wasting your money any more than I want to waste mine. So let's get going. Wow, this welder is so smooth. Wow, guys. Unbelievable! Guys, this flows and wets in like aluminum. I am totally impressed with how this works. I don't know if it's going to crack or not. We will see. But my first impression is, wow, this is cool. This is awesome. I don't know how much strength it will hold, but boy, I'll tell you, it flows some nice. Look at that tack, guys. That's a little, probably half inch long bead and that thing flowed so nice we're going to do the front and back i'm going to do over here now and i'll bring it right to this tack and then we'll grind it out wow totally impressive let me go grind those tacks real quick and then we'll continue to weld if you're regular viewers, you'll know that we just built this rack last week, and I'll have a link up above. You guys can check it out. This is real handy. All right, here we go. Guys, this welds so incredibly awesome. I'm just curious how strong it is, but it's producing a really nice looking weld. And I'm not using, uh, but probably half pedal guys. Now you're not going to get overly pretty looking welds with this stuff guys. And the only reason I say that is because you're starting and stopping and uh, you're peening and whatnot. But it looks pretty decent. There's a little wormhole right there uh, looks fairly decent through there that might be a little bit of glass yeah that's not a wormhole that's just glass impurity yep all right let's flip it over and do the back so we're going to fill all along there all along there it kind of pretty much already did but we're just going to put another layer on through it because it went i had full penetration there and if you're wondering if welding both sides of cast iron actually make the part stronger, I have a link to that. You can click the link up above. Uh, I think it might surprise you. All right, let's get this side welded up.
A needle scaler works good for doing stuff like this too, guys. If it's, it's, if it's fairly delicate, a needle scaler wouldn't work that great, but um, it will save you time from having to peanut. it. I've never seen anything like this, guys. This is flowing in like aluminum. It, it has very similar properties. That's not good. Very seldom will the weld ever crack on the repaired area. It's just outside that, in the heat affected zone. It'll always break if you repair cast iron and it's going to fail. It always fails just outside the weld into the heat affected zone, which is pretty much at the toe of the weld. You can see right here, or I hope you can see, there's a crack that's running right from here to here. It looks like maybe a one inch crack. We'll see uh, if that went through the other side, but let's get this thing buried and insulated so it can cool down slowly. And all this is, guys, is this is just some play sand that you can pick up at Home Depot. Nothing fancy. And while that's cooling, guys, I just want to show you this welding hood, how awesome it is. Now, so it's got, you know, 180 degree panoramic view, but check out the inside. So the, so the headgear's got a ton of adjustment in it, which I like, but it took me a little bit uh, to get this adjusted right. It was almost like a little bit too much of adjustment. Uh, sometimes when you have too many options, uh, it makes things a little more difficult, uh, but I got it adjusted really good now, so it feels really comfortable. And this also has grind mode and obviously like different shades, which is nice, but uh, what's kind of cool is watch, okay? So you're looking through the front and watch through the panoramic ones. They have their own sensors. So like right now, there we go, it just turned on. Now it turned off, but look through the side ones. They kind of do, see if I can get them to trigger. Okay, look at that, so watch. See through the side there? So you can see through the front and the side, look at that, it's flickering, but as soon as it, there we go, look. So now it's it's triggered because of the, because of the light. There we go, now it just turned off, now it turned on. So, so kind of like the side panoramics are independent of the front, which is not, there we go, see that one just turned off, turned on. So yeah, they work pretty slick, it just, it feels really weird to have light coming through the, the hood. It's a real good hood, guys. It's budget minded and uh, definitely if you got to have a welding hood this would probably be the one that I would pick. So check it out I'll have links to it and like I said I have exclusive deals it'll save you some money as well at checkout. Alright guys our next day let's go dig into our bucket and see how it looks. So the parts had just over maybe 20 hours to cool yeah, it's completely cooled room temp right now. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, it developed a crack. Yep. That is a failure. So you can see there's a crack that's running. It's stopping right there. And it's running all along that length. So, yeah, not good. But let's give it a try, see if we can see what it takes to break it off. So in an effort to try to find an explanation of why that cracked, I thought actually maybe it was because copper uh, took so much temperature to melt compared to the stainless. Well, after doing a little bit of investigation and figuring out the melting temps, uh, copper is actually the least of the two of the filler metals. I've got Celsius over here in this column for you guys. So and Then I was thinking, well, maybe because the temperatures are a lot higher with stainless and copper than a traditional nickel, well, nickel's 2646, and that's a, a well-respected and very common repair filler metal. So it's, it's not that. Um, stainless and nickel have a very close melting temp, so it's not necessarily an over temp thing. I've done lots of uh, cast iron welding and I've just never had good luck with stainless. I think, you know, because the stainless and the nickel have a very close temperature to one another, uh, nickel very rarely, if ever, will fail cast iron. And I think that that's just because it's much more malleable than the stainless. And I think that that's what's causing the problem that uh, it, because it's not malleable, it creates tension, you know, forces within the metal pulling or pushing 
uh, and then that causes cracking. So that's my take on it, but uh, I'm sure some metallurgists can probably enlighten us. All right, guys, so here's the setup. I got the pan clamped to the table. We've got a bucket hanging off the handle that's free hanging off that. And so that my plate doesn't end up flipping over, we've got a board that goes up to the ceiling that keeps that plate from tipping up like that. Now we're going to just start loading it up with weight and see what it takes to snap the handle off. Because it's already cracked, I consider this a failure already. So. That's a good sign so far. See if we can take two of these. Huh. Let's add another 17 pound block of weight. Let's uh, keep adding some weight to it. She's gonna go. Did you hear that, guys? Whoa, boy, there's two of those guys. Let's retrieve the uh, handle and take a look at it. So it broke just how I suspected it would whenever you weld cast iron. Like I said, it breaks just outside the weld zone or just at the toe or just beyond it, which is the heat affected zone. You can see it's all fresh metal. None of that is actual weld. That's all fresh virgin cast iron, except for over here. There's a little piece right here where it actually broke into the weld itself. So guys, I'm not gonna even bother weigh that piece just because it was a total failure. If it didn't crack uh, prior to us uh, hanging the weight off it, then yeah, I, I would have weighed it, but it was 100 pounds or less, and that's not a success, so. When you repair cast iron, you can't have it be cracked before you even put it back into service. So now let me give you an idea of some of the past uh, tests that we've done. It'll pretty much take that entire bucket and all it took was pretty much just the stuff that was sitting on top. And that's all there is to it, guys. I want to thank you for watching. Thank you guys for tuning in. There's new episodes every Friday, so I hope you found this interesting. Be sure to tune in next week. Like, comment, and subscribe. Be sure to check out my merch. I just got a whole bunch of merch that I started doing. You guys have been after me, so I figured I'd do it. And if you're wondering about any of the tools or any of the things that you saw me using, check the links down below. You'll also have discount codes and promo codes that'll save you some money at checkout. Until next week, guys, I will see you then. Take care, stay safe, like, comment, subscribe. See ya. Come, come.